Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Artist's Well. Uh, this is our third season, and uh, even though it's episode one, it's actually the 81st uh, episode in total of what we've done, which is super. Now, my special guest this morning is Lenny Abrahamson. Um, Lenny is, amongst various other things, president of the United Arts Club, and that's how I know him. Um, but Lenny has uh, as, as many gongs and nominations for Oscars as, as you could shake a stick at. Uh, and he has a, had a phenomenal meteoric career. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to having a chat to him about that. But first, I'd like to know why he went to Trinity to study physics and philosophy. Has that anything to do with the movies? Or had he intended at that point to actually go into the movies? Good morning, Lenny. Good morning, Alan, and thanks so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, so yeah, I, I I was you know I was interested in all sorts of things as a teenager, and I certainly loved uh, cinema. I mean, it was a, I was sort of addicted to the screen in any way that I could get it. I watched television. For I used to sit in the house when you know waiting for the TV to start on a Saturday morning, waiting for the kids' programs to start. Um, and I would, and I loved everything to do with the cinema. But I think it didn't, it didn't figure as a possible life for me at that point. Maybe because it seemed like a, a sort of an outrageous thing to, to imagine doing as a kid in Dublin at that time in the seventies, I suppose. Um, but I was really interested in ideas and books and all sorts. And I was also, I think, in a way which is not a good thing, very concerned with being clever. You know, and I don't know that I know other kids. Kids are. Uh, you know, you see it in children sometimes that desire to sort of achieve and please and, uh, you know, and and, and, and somehow the, the physics thing, although I was really interested in it, it also sounded like it was officially the hardest thing you could study, you know, <laughs> That's theoretical physics. So, so I'm going to do it because that'll just prove, you know, to mm. everybody. Um, there was just this huge emphasis in my house, in my family, uh, towards academic success, you know. Yes. Um, and uh, and there were various members of the family going back who'd done very well, and that was the lore of the of the house I grew up in. And then, but then I I did study physics for a while, physics and maths, and I did enjoy it, but I wasn't. It wasn't what I sort of was really interested in, which was the sort of, uh, you know, it's it's an awful lot of maths, and and I was good at it, but not amazing. And there were two. Uh, people in the class who I remember just going, okay, so that's what it looks like when it's really your thing, you know. Yeah, and you also just first the, class honors, didn't you? Well, I did it. I got first honors in philosophy when I flipped. So I flipped over to, um, I flipped after two years of physics and maths to philosophy, which felt like home. Then you know, I, I really when I when I got into philosophy, it was that combination of the kind of of the the sort of general fascination with the world and being and 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 the human condition um which tallied with my love of the arts and literature and, and that felt like it was the kind of a much more central kind of place for me to be and I loved it but while I was doing that I had this friend um Ed Guiney who I'd known since we were about 15 Ed was in he was in a you know in Gonzaga I was in high school in in yeah. Rathgar and um but Ed Ed's school used to go to parties with my sister's school and I used to tag it along um, and I met him at these like teenage parties Yes, and he was fascinated with film and I was too and we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and when I was in college doing uh, philosophy Ed rang me and said I want to set up this thing this I want to set up something that allows us to make some films and it's really interesting because the dynamic of our careers together and we still work together um is very much that Ed is the one who makes things happen and does things. I'm the one who sort of thinks about it and goes, God, that would be fascinating. <laughs> and then would probably not do anything. Um, so I'm very You're lucky a bit to- modest there now. <laughs> well, um, so we set up this, this yeah. group, uh, Trinity Filmmakers Group, and um, started to mess around with video. And that was the first time I think I thought, ooh, maybe this is a real- possibility for me because I so I was always I was sort of halfway split between academia when I graduated and film and, and actually went off to I went to Stanford to do a PhD in philosophy um but I was kind of in two minds about it when I went I got a scholarship and therefore it was a sort of it felt like a risk I could just go and see what it was like and 
and I did again the subject is fascinating but the academic life and the limit the limited communication you have in terms of the people that you're talking to mm. and then just this kind of more maverick energy that I think I probably have which lent me towards trying to be an artist ultimately um yeah. uh, and so I was playing I'd made I made this short called Three Joes when I graduated um from Trinity and while I was at Stanford that started to kind of travel a bit and 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 show at proper festivals and and I remember talking to my friends, they were all at the Cork Film Festival where, where it had won the prize and uh, they were all drunk and having a really good time. And I was in a, writing an essay on Kant in a, in a kind of, <laughs> in a very quiet town out in yeah. California. And yeah. so I'd always make the joke that I, 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 I went the wrong way. You know, most people leave Ireland and go to California in an effort to become a filmmaker. I left California and returned to Dublin um when I decided yes cinema is for me yeah yeah and d d did you have a leaning towards a particular genre in filmmaking yeah because I, I get the impression so that, that that your your work is, is very much consumed with um the sort of the human condition as you said yourself um ra rather than you know horror action blah 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 yeah genre has never yeah. interested me really okay I think you know uh so as a kid, I watched everything. But as I started to get on into my late teens and discovered kind of European cinema, I think that's where I went, oh, my God, that's it. You know, there, there used to be, and it's a really interesting thing, and you think about how how kind of oddly, even though we can now watch everything, you know, you can sign up for, you can find every film you want. Um, and in those days, you couldn't. However, people tend to become very bunkered in what, what they watch. You know, they just seek out the, the same things. Back in the time I'm thinking about, like late early 80s, late 70s, I was, you know, all there was was what was on the TV or in the cinema. But yeah. BBC, too, used to screen uh, European Masters cinema in, you know, late at night when they didn't have anything else to show. Mm. And I just watched all these films and saw Fellini and Bergman and um, you know, uh, Ozu and people like that, that I'd never um, heard of. And that was the kind of point for me where cinema and my interests already in ideas and literature and mm. that stuff became kind of fused. I know. And that's what was sort of motivating me as I went on. Okay. Now, tell me for the uninitiated, I'm one of them. Can you explain the difference between a director, a producer, a cameraman, a sound man? You know, because you're, there's all these people. Yeah. And they all seem to have very specific different jobs and, and they yeah. must gel together. But yes. can you sort of do a quick definition of what is a film director? Because you, yeah, you don't so, use a camera, do you? No, no. sometimes. I mean, yeah. I do occasionally operate the camera if I just want to be looking through okay. during a take, but I'm not a particularly good uh, camera person. Um so what the director, like, if you think about it, you know, you you somehow assume when you see a film that this event is kind of happening and, and the camera is just like, you know, recording it. But, you know, from the beginning of the process, that's what, God, this is such a big question. So, I mean, the, the let's, conventional let's answer the is rather than anything else. Yeah, then. the conventional answer is the director is the author of the of the film. And that's true in cinema much more than in television, although that's changing radically now mm. um so um like in the most basic way when we arrive on set i will have been involved i've probably written something on the script if not done my own draft but um i will like who's in it is the decision that i make so the casting putting the crew together is something that i'm central to so choosing the collaborators but then um working with the actors to create the characters deciding literally where people are in the room where the camera is how the story unfolds how the sequences come together how they're paced so you know you walk into a room well do we do we discover you there do we do we wait for you do we go in with you in whose perspective are we so every it's it, so it's quite technical what shots you take where the camera is whether it moves or not what the people are doing how the actors are performing so the making the actual decisions about the making of it, and then you'll say to the uh, camera operator, okay, I want you to be over here. And as the person walks here, I want us to, you know, whether it's track or handheld. So how the camera is operated is also your decision, but you mm. just don't hold it. Sure. But there is there is one thing that's worth saying. Mm. 
which is there comes a point in the process where I think the luxury or the kind of necessity for the director is to drop their professional um, perspective and actually just become what I say, I often describe as just the human being in the room because there are, you know, the camera person is concerned about all sorts of things as they shoot. The, the cinematographer is watching the monitor, looking at the lighting. Um, the grip is is deciding when, you know, I've said, listen, I want you to push the dolly this slow and go on this line and end on this line in this frame. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're thinking about. So I'm the person in the room that has nothing to do while the camera is rolling. Interesting. And my and my job at that point is to feel is to say to myself and the fundamental question that I always have somewhere deep down is, do I believe this? And if I don't, what do I have to change to make this feel truthful? Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're really sitting in the uh, the viewer's chair. Exactly. And that's the sort of privilege of it, you know, um, but it's also the scary bit, because then then if it's not working and everybody can feel it's not working, all the eyes sort of go to you as to. So so <laughs> you know, this is crap. What are we going to do? Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 But and how much of that is pre-staged in terms of you sitting down with a bunch of people saying, look, we're good because the money starts rolling the minute you go on set. So yes. outside of that, it's cheap. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So the pre preparation is a massive part of it. In fact, it's it it's the make or break. And mm. typically, there's this what you might call there's the development process, which starts when you start talking about the project and working uh, on the script and um, and thinking about putting it together, what it is. But then you go into what you might call soft prep, which is um, where you're like. Um, starting to have real conversations about what crew you're going to have, starting to make initial inquiries, starting to do kind of thinking about locations, maybe visiting places, doing all that stuff. But then the prep, the full prep, where you have like often a very, very big uh, number of people, you might have 50 or 60 people by the end of prep already working yes. in an office that's got together specifically for that job. So on a film, the prep could take 10 weeks, you know, yes. for uh, the full preparation where you're really, everybody's working, you know, full time, mm. could take 10 weeks for a, an eight week shoot. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yes, you're right. You're trying to understand it as deeply as possible. You're having lots of meetings with designers and costume designers and, and casting, you're casting yeah. probably from earlier. Yeah. So like a, typically a film is in the wonderful scenario where like say, actually take something like normal people mm. where, it was unusually quick because we got what they called the green light from the BBC based purely on the novel and, and our group of creative people doing the novel. And the BBC said, OK, if you if you can get the rights to that novel, we will we will shoot it next year. And that almost never happens. Normally, there's like yeah. a year's worth of writing scripts and treatments and hawking them around and getting. Yes, we like it. But could you change this? And eventually somebody says, right, we'll make it. So the very, very best case scenario was normal people where we read the books that what do you think is the vote of confidence in us and our big risk and said, right, we will fund it if you can get the rights because it was a competitive situation on the rights to the novel. Yeah. And us mm -hmm. being able to say to Sally, we actually have a green light to make this. Like mm -hmm. it's nobody else has that. Nobody is ever going to have that before it exists. Okay. So in that scenario, it still was a year before we shot. Um, because that it took a year and that was super quick to uh, get the novel into shape as a, as a script, series of screenplays and put together the crew and cast. Yeah. And that was a year. And then it's another year, nearly eight months or so before it's on the screen. That's super quick. I mean, that almost never happens. You're looking more like three or four years often. Really? And, and when you do all this plan, planning, Lenny, um, does, it, does it ever get to the stage where you're sort of halfway through the actual filming when you say, Hold on, that's not working out the way we thought. Or oh, yeah. You, have, you feel you have to change the direction or something like that. Yes. I think that's the other thing that I feel like whenever I give any sort of, do any sort of educating stuff with, with filmmakers, I always say this, that I remember watching this brilliant, um, I think it was a conductor like Zubin Mehta or one of the great uh, conductors uh, or George Schulte or somebody like that giving a masterclass. And this young com conductor got up to do his bit. And he was, I thought he was amazing, you know, as a non-specialist watching, he was full of intensity and giving loads of gestures. And, yeah. and then Chelsea said, you know, that's great, but you're conducting the imaginary orchestra in your head. You're not conducting the actual musicians in front of you. Yeah. So 
and that's the that for me is the single best kind of piece of advice when it comes to the kind of work that I do. I think it's different if you're an, uh, a novelist or a, a painter, probably, although there still probably is something in your mind mm. and something in front of you. And for me, it's it's recognizing, it's being able to switch off from the image mm. that you had and watch what's in front of you and really work with that and, and embrace the fact that it will be a bit different. Yes. Uh, because I think what what often happens is people are kind of in a box ticking state as directors mm. because it's a scary thing to do, especially early on when you have a whole crew around you and there's a lot of money at stake and and mm. people are kind of looking at you and you don't know if they think you're any good and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. so you do a take and you, there's, you know you do a couple of takes of something and it's very very tempting to go. Everybody think that's good. Everybody seems to think it's good. That's done. Let's move on to the next thing. Mm. Mm. But you're not then engaging with it, really, you know. So for me, I think it's very good, that feeling you describe of looking at something and going, what's not right about this? Not so much that it doesn't exactly fit the thing you had in your mind in prep, but just more, it doesn't feel like it's its best self. Yes. Um, that's the thing to go towards rather than kind of the natural tendency is to hope that you're wrong, hope that it'll all work out okay, not show any kind of uncertainty or weakness in front of the crew of people, <laughs> yes. especially yeah. when you start who are way more experienced and older mostly than you. Mm. But then you're not doing your job and actually they don't want you to be doing that. They want you to do the bit that you're supposed to do, which is to, yes. is to take hold of the feeling of the thing yeah. and, and guard it and make it as good as it can be. So I, pre I presume you don't after a take then say, well, what did you think of that, guys? You were the, no, no. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, I've heard terrible stories. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's also that thing of, you know, people talk about in soccer losing the dressing room, yes. you know, where, where a manager suddenly just loses the authority with the players. And it's absolutely the equivalent yeah. on a film yeah. set where if people start to think you don't know what you're doing, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get yeah. them back. Yeah. Now, Lenny, there's a number of other areas we want to move into, but before we do, just sticking with the film, um, and, and I know people will have uh, questions to do with that specifically, but in case it's not asked, one thing that I'm fascinated about is music and the emotion music Me brings too. to cinema, to film, and how really, you know, the acting is naked unless it's got some music and, and the effect that has. How on earth do you choose that? Well, it's a combination of things. So up until very recently, it's all been original composed music. I've never done what they call needle drops where you, uh, you know, well, there's two different types. Sometimes people will go and find a piece of existing classical music or whatever, and they'll clear the rights to it. And that I have done that. Yeah. And then there, there there's a the thing of using contemporary songs and things like that, which is a very kind of commercial approach yes. it can be. And I haven't really done that up until the last two things. But it's usually I work with the same. So I'm lucky. I said I worked. I've been working with Ed since we were 15, and I've been working with a man called Stephen Rennick since. Well, we weren't working together when we were nine, but we knew we were in school, primary school together. Yeah. Stephen was always a brilliant musician, and as time went on, it just he started composing, and when we when we were just messing around, mm. and he still is. And we actually had this lovely event in the concert hall a few weeks ago where the concert orchestra, they screened room with a live orchestra with Stephen score, Wonderful. which was really yeah. lovely. Um, but it, that's a really interesting collaboration because as a director, now I am somewhat musical. And so I know I can talk, I can talk a little bit of the technicals about, you know, what yeah. I feel about a piece and whatever. And I used to play a bit and I used to play with Stephen. So that's good because we've got a sort of language together. But it's not like other things where you can say to a designer, no, I think, you know, that wallpaper, please. Um, because it, it it's a, this ineffable thing. And so you try, it's trial and error. And you use, sometimes you use temp tracks. So in other words, something that you think might be in the right territory, you put that up against picture. You see whether it does what you want it to do. Mm. And then you have that discussion with the composer. Very um, organic kind of um, muddle in a good, yes. in a good way. Yes. Until you arrive at sometimes what will happen is there'll be one piece in, in the case, my case with Stephen Wrights, which we both go, aha, that's the key to the, yeah, that's the key to the, I remember with Adam and Paul, we had this idea of a kind of, uh, of marking out the Europeanness of the film and, and also it's odd sort of gypsy, um, Central Europeanness 
Mm. And so this idea of a kind of village band somewhere in the Czech Republic kind of popped into everybody's head, you know, <laughs> and and that's where this strange kind of kind of lumbering but lovely soundtrack emerged from. Yes. So that's really you and the composer, is it? So it's me and the composer and the other person. The, yeah. And then if, if we're looking for tracks from existing music, sometimes would work with a, a music supervisor. And a music supervisor is somebody who has a massive encyclopedic knowledge of the world of music. Yeah. And what will happen then is, um, in, in my case, a wonderful woman called Juliette Martin will throw millions of tracks at me and the editor. Mm. And Nathan, the editor, is very musical as well. He's got a great library. So he'll go, here, have a listen to this. Yeah. And then we we all listen. And and it is ultimately my, luckily, because I've, I've been lucky enough to have the you know control but i've never had to impose i never have to go no you're all wrong get out <laughs> i'm doing it my way it's it it, it 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 is a collaborative process yes um, and then we decide what's going to go in so that is part of my my job yeah very interesting okay let's let's move away from film a little bit and talk about your sort of uh, contact with art in the, in, the, in the general sense and your your background and so on um is is there anything sort of that that would show us how you really came to be who you are today, you know, because most of the people watching this now are visual artists. So they'd be looking at everything you've said. And, and I must say, it, it can translate beautifully to, to yes. a visual artist. Do you know what um, I mean, I, I, I just, ha I think it's sort of interesting that you discover sort of what you are as you go, you know, I wasn't the sort of person who was like begging my parents for a Super 8 camera at eight years old or 10 years old. I wasn't running around pretending to blow up spaceships in the back garden, you know, with a camera. It wasn't. So it's not that sort of Spielberg story where you, yeah. um, you know, um, my interest was in kind of. Was like so. So as a younger person, it was like I was books where I found um, the things that I found most moving and um, and most kind of opening, you know, and yeah. and actually visual art. Then, in my late teens, I remember going to galleries and seeing, you know, for example, so the Dutch masters, mm. and just seeing these faces, the cold light, and these faces that seem to have the most extraordinary depth, and and so I was just a very engaged, very kind of. Um, kind of questioning sort of kid mm, mm, mm. and cinema came later as this odd synthesis of lots of things that I'm interested in yeah literature visual art mm. um drama and I've, and interestingly enough for me plays were never part of it really theater was much less part of it and yeah. I think theater and film are so different mm. film is a kind of you know film there is a there is ultimately a narrator there is somebody bringing you through this yeah. experience saying look at this now look at this now don't look at that mm -hmm. and 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 so the that somehow that kind of marriage that kind of in the way that opera marries lots of forms cinema marries lots of forms and i'm a kind of magpie you know yeah. no it's uh, interesting that, that you talk about yeah it's interesting you talk about the, the dutch painters and so on because you can see a, a bit of an analogy between some of the scenes say in normal people where, where your lighting and everything else is, mm. is very much how an artist would set it up. Well, it is. I'm always interested in uh, a kind of, I think, you know, I, I, I can't stand um, pretty lighting, you know, I th beautiful lighting. Yes, but the, the kind of, I don't think our job as filmmakers should be just, well, that's not true because uh, there's you mean room chocolate for everything. Box. Chocolate, chocolate box, box. exactly. <laughs> And and so that like trying to find that look, say with with normal people, hmm. of something which is kind of cold and real but not ordinary is a very hard. Yeah. It's a very thin line, you know. It's a very kind of uh, small space to land in. And I work with this wonderful cinematographer called Susie Lavelle. She's she's from Ackle Island. She's started as a photographer, and she's now right, you know, she's going through the roof as a, as a cinematographer. But yeah. she has that same impulse. And we looked at lot, you know, we looked at lots of paintings um, and lots of photos, like Nan Golden photography and lots of really amazing uh photographers to find the sort of feeling of it. Yeah. And and yes, 
yeah, it's certainly not. It, 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 it is that same painterly thing that I think is, is so beautiful to play with. Sure. And, and talking about painters and artists, uh, it, it, was there any connection with your parents to some notable painters yes. and artists that, that, that seemed to... Yeah, well, <laughs> my, my folks, neither of them... My dad was artistic, you know, he painted, he uh, sculpted a bit and actually showed a bit in the RHA, and, but he was a solicitor, but that was his yeah. job. Yes. Um, but his father, my namesake, um, was this quite famous doctor back in the, I don't know, 40s probably, as, as height of his. And he among his patients was uh, were the Beckett family on the one hand and the Yeatses. So he was he had this amazing collection of Jack Yates paintings because Jack Yates used to pay him in paintings. And unfortunately, they didn't come down. None of them came down to me. <laughs> but um, but uh, I remember when I was 21, my dad had, for my birthday, he found this thing. He was pa passing an antique shop and there was an old menu from Jamais, which we were talking about earlier, this right. famous restaurant in Dublin. And it was a dinner in honor of Jack Yates. And there were like 10 of his friends there. And they'd all signed this menu. And one of them was my grandfather. It's my name. And there was a little horse, little a little pen drawing of a horse on the menu done by Yates. So I have that. Oh, have you? Um, yeah, which is amazing. Fabulous. Um, yeah. And, uh, but then the other great story was, you know, because there's always these families very big on my grandfather being this amazing man. And I was reading this biography of, of Beckett. And I looked, I saw a mention in the appendix of, of Leonard Abrahams. And I thought, oh, cool. there we go. It's going to be, you know, some story about my grandfather. And I looked it up and it was sure. about like the, the most traumatic um, kind of thing in, in Beckett's life was his, the death of his father, who he's very close to. And uh, it describes how he had this kind of mild heart attack and the eminent cardiologist, Leonard Abrahamson, whisked out, you know, was whisked out to the house, gave, examined him and said, not, not, not a bother, you know, he's grand. He's grand. <laughs> he'd be grand, just a bit of rest and he'll be fine. And then he left and, you know, 15 minutes later, he had this massive heart attack and died. So I thought, <laughs> There we go. That's that's my legacy. That's my grandfather's <laughs> legacy. That's very unfortunate. <laughs> very unfortunate. So, Lenny, um, what what do you do in your downtime when you're not filming and thinking about films and all of that? Have I mean, you any I sort of hobbies or interests? Yeah, you know, I wish I I should have more because I think it's incredibly healthy. So I've got I've two dogs who I really love. These two mad rescue lurchers. Mm -hmm. So running around with them. Um, but our kids are still quite young, so 14 and 11. Great. And our 14-year-old boy is, well, he's kind of doesn't take much minding now. He just wanders around in a cloud of links and, uh, you know, <laughs> wants to <laughs> wants to go to the, you know, go to the spa shop for a chicken fillet roll or you yeah. know, meet his friends. And our daughter, but our daughter now, she's 11 and she's very kind of, you know, still very like connected in terms of things we do on the weekend. But I, I suppose... I, I'd loved I, I do odd things like I've been we moved we moved house so this is a project and that's taking up a lot of time moved house into this and you can see this sort of strange well it's not strange actually quite nice kind of arts and crafts wallpaper where, where, where the did the wall hole in the wall go uh, the hole in the wall because the family's in the kitchen so I had to ah, close the door okay. so Alan thought there was a lovely painting behind me in the in the space behind that door it's actually a hole in the wall well, I thought it was an installation the... Lenny not <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's conceptual, Alan. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, so, so we bought this uh, place in in Lachlanstown, which is um, an old glebe house, but it's it's an odd house. It was split into two in the fifties, so we have most of it, and then our lovely neighbours have a chunk of it. And so that's a big project of restoration. Yeah. Um, but I'm bad. I potter around, and and I, I, you know, I have to. I'm, I I have a real tendency towards kind of anxiety or kind of overthinking things. Mm -hmm. And and um, and I have to so I end up either working or not or or just trying to sort of switch myself off. And I don't think that's so healthy. My dad was a great hobbyist. You know, he used to he used to sculpt and, as I said, wood carve and things. And one of the great things about this place is there's a bit there's a what were all, all stables, not big, just to kind of but two great sheds. Mm. So I think I may the shed is a very important part of. Uh, of life, I think if you can do something good with a shed, 
and and that might be a place to for me to to sort of I used to turn I used to wood turn and things like that and I might go back to that yeah yeah so is there a lot of work to be done on this this house yeah in terms of getting it back to because I yeah. did mention you see that that you're involved in a conservation project so this is yes. it but, yeah this is it so We've already, we've been here two years and we've done, we've been doing it bit by bit. So we already, there is a lot of work is the answer. Yeah, because the oldest part is setting these. And sorry, can you say that it's again? It's in remarkable 50s was the oldest uh, part of the house. Yeah. Um, but we've done, you know, it's remarkably, it's in very good shape. I think that for us, we thought when we moved from Rath Mines and we thought, look, this beautiful old house is pretty in the same price as our, the house we're living in now in in Dublin six fantastic but I don't think we were quite prepared for the amount of uh you know work that would be now I realize why it was uh what yeah. we thought relatively cheap yes. um but so what we we do have a fair bit we're working with this lovely conservation architect called Neil Crimmins he's a member of the arts club actually I got I got him to join um I bullied him into joining and uh he he's so what we've been doing we've just got our planning permission we're not doing anything rather to the house at all we just want to kind of bring it back to the way it was um you know but make it warm and and uh and all of that stuff hmm. but there is a fair bit of work to do but we've been working with lovely like amazing craftspeople you know the, the, the plasterers who do the old line plaster and and a roofer who just that's so the roof and the outside walls are done which means that the house is now oh, weatherproof safe. properly yeah exactly yeah. but we'll have to move out at some point to do the kind of you know all of the electrics and plumbing and everything like that that okay. we need to do. Yeah, very good. Okay, um, uh, one other question before I open it to the floor, and that is, uh, what I normally ask the the, the uh, visual artists who their favourite artist is, um, and you know if if they could uh, grab, steal, whatever, borrow one to hang over their mantel place, what would it be? And the answers are very interesting because they're very often quite the opposite to their own particular style yeah. of art. Um, but in your case, I'm not sure what to ask you, because uh, uh, it could yeah. be a piece of art or it could be a film or a director. I mean, I think I probably I was narrowing it down, just yeah. making notes to myself. Yeah. Um, if I could have done anything at all, you know, if I could have my name attached to any piece of work, not, not necessarily in my own field, mm. it would probably be, you know, one of the great pieces of chamber music, like, you know, um, Schubert or Beethoven quartets or you know those are those are kind of for me the kind of just the most pure kind of expression of of brilliance and um, but in film um I I, I mean and I my stuff is not like his at all and I don't think anybody's is but and it's not original because you know but Tarkovsky is probably Tarkovsky's film Mirror mm -hmm. is such yeah, a perfect uh, yeah, I just highly, I mean, highly recommend it. It opens with this woman sitting on a fence talking to a passing fan passes. And then it, it's very, very, in a way, simple. But then it sort of opens out into the closest thing to the to the way in which the intensity of feeling of dreams might be. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I don't think anybody before or after Tarkovsky had the same mastery of the medium. How, like how the absolute mas mastery. Oh. So T-A-R-K-O- VSKI, Andrei Tarkovsky. His most famous film is a film called Andrei Rublev about the icon painter, the famous Russian icon painter. All right, yeah. And Lenny, how would you get to see that? Would that be on Netflix or? It probably isn't on Netflix, but you will find it on like uh, iTunes or. How would you? Um, yeah, you'll find it somewhere for sure. Yeah. It's it's an absolute, you know, any of his films, but Mirror or Rublev, I think, are. Oh, just sorted out my viewing for this evening well yeah let me let me know how you find it I, mm -hmm. I just I was sort of overwhelmed I remember the first time I saw it in a film club mirror yeah. I didn't understand it but I knew that it was something really special and I've watched it many times since I still don't I don't think it's the kind of thing that you decode but it is I know. amazing yeah. well, whilst we're talking about films um have you any clips that you'd like to show us of some of your yeah, work yeah I, I was wondering I mean so yeah. um I might just show you a little clip from Garage Okay. which is um and it's funny because pat short bumped into uh connor j ryan the boy who plays uh, for anybody who's seen it there's a sort of man who works in a garage and then he becomes friendly with this kid who comes to help him uh 
and uh, they just bumped into each other again. So I have a photograph of them 14 years later. Mm -hmm. But I'll play a little scene from Gary just to set it up. Um, Josie is this kind of, you know, town sort of village joke in a way, but he he's a kind of very attached to his own uh, to the village. You know, he's the, his mm. biggest fan, and it's and it's and and the person who suffers most there really. Mm. But um, he he made a terrible mistake and showed a kind of porn image to this fifteen year old boy who was working with him, and the owner of the garage has come to let him go and tell him he's closing the place, but. It's just how we chose to do it. Um, uh, it might be worth worth talking about. I'll just yeah, lovely. Put this Thank on you. now. It'll only take two minutes now. You sure? I am sure. Sure. Strong? No, no, not too strong. Oh, this milk is all right. Do you think it's all right? It says 29. Sure, it's grand, Josie. Is, I think it's interesting because we never show the moment when Mr. Callagher, the garage owner, tells Josie that he's closing the garage. What we watch is this ceremony of procrastination where Josie makes tea for him and then gets very flustered about the fact that the milk is maybe starting to go off and there are spots in the milk. And it's just, it's a really, I think, from Marco Hollow and a great piece of writing. And it's a way of, of doing what you're doing without directly getting into the kind of you know, soapy dialogue that you might sometimes have in a scene like that. Um, but what was interesting about it is we actually wrote the full dialogue and we knew, but we knew we weren't going to show it, but we filmed it because I didn't want the actors to aim towards the end. What I knew was the end of the scene. Yes. I didn't want them to sort of put a button on it, if you know what I mean. So they play right through it, but we stop at the point where we knew right. we were going to stop. Um, and and the uh, yeah, so that was the clip I was uh, I I just showed, and then the, the I can talk a little bit about the Frank clip, which Ooh, is yeah. Frank explaining to John why he wears the head. Can I ask you something? Sure. Why do you wear that? You think it's weird? Kinda. Well, normal faces are weird too. You know? The way they're smooth. Smooth, smooth, and then, you know, all bumpy and holes. I mean, what are eyes like? It's like a science fiction movie. Don't get me started on lips. Like the edges of a very serious wound. That's true. <laughs> but your head is still sort of intimidating. Well, underneath, I'm giving you a welcoming smile. Would it help if I said my facial expressions out loud? Well, maybe. Welcoming smile. Delighted look. Frank in cinemas May 9. It's, it's, so it's a combination of things that I love in that clip. My interest in slapstick, which is something that we haven't really talked about, but mm -hmm. I've always, Adam and Paul is very much homage to kind of Laurel and Hardy. And okay. I love that kind of sad, uh, sad, soft, physical comedy very much. I find it very moving. And it's there in Beckett in, yeah. in spades, obviously. So that was Mark and my sort of 
um, juvenile homage to, to that. David, I see you're, you're the first to undo your button. Yeah, as I'm as well. <laughs> fascinated, Lenny, that you went into film, but where did you learn your craft as a director? You didn't learn it in the theatre, obviously. And what most film directors start in the theatre and go on to, to cinema, but you, you went straight into cinema. So how did you do it? Um, that's a very good question because they're sort of, I'm often asked about by people, should I go to film school or, you know, mm -hmm. I think because the two routes, you're right, were traditionally theatre and then laterally uh, film school. I learned it by, um, by I mean, and I think this is still a huge part of how people learn filmmaking is by watching massive amounts of film but watching it critically and, and reading and understanding a little bit about how they were made and then volunteering and doing sort of crappy jobs on other people's mm. projects so as I could see how the kind of the sausage was made and then in the doing so it was more of a kind of apprenticeship than it was a a, a formal uh, study and um I think had there maybe had there been a, a sort of a really good film school at the time, maybe I would have thought about it. But I, I oddly, I think like writing, you can sort of learn it by by doing it. And um, and I worked in different departments a bit in the on film, so I kind of got a a, a bit more of a rounded picture of how things are done. And and I'm good, you know, the funny thing that that capacity to learn, which I had as an academic person, definitely helped, you know, to sort of um, analyze and and uh, and kind of work out how things. But the biggest question in film, which you, which is really, really hard to answer and you have to work to find it, is how is how do you make something feel a certain way? Like, how do you shoot anybody? I mean, that's not fair, but many people would be able to put together a series of shots which successfully covered an, a piece of action. You know, it might, mightn't be elegant, but it would do the job. And you see it on television all the time, just sort of a fairly mechanical approach to covering people's actions. You know, you have two people walking into a room to have a conversation. You have a wide shot where they walk into the room and then they find, they get them facing each other as quick as they can because that's the easiest way to do it. And then they have one shot of one person over the shoulder and the other shot of the other person over the shoulder. That's the end of it. And most TV soap is just that again and again and again. And, uh, but but if you, want to, if you want to deal in subtle shades of feeling and tone, that's where it gets really interesting. And I think the only way to, 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 to work out how to do that is to just keep doing it. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Are you happy with that, David? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? I'll just read out, there's one from Kira Gormley here that says, thanks, Lenny. Do you find it hard to know when you've reached the final edit with a film and not to make any more changes? Yes, I do. And, and what's great, in, in the film world, I suppose, as opposed to um, if you're making a painting in your studio is you have an awful lot of other people screaming at you to, but it's probably, if you're working towards an exhibition, it's the same. I presume there just comes a point where you go, okay, well, I have to stop. But uh, uh, there is also a sort of diminishing returns moment, I think, where you may still tinker, but you realize that nothing is fundamentally changing. And then that's probably the moment to, to leave it. It's a hard one, and I've, I've, you know, watching something you've done in the cinema or whatever at a festival, it's always nerve wracking, you know, because yeah. you think, oh God, what if I discover some new thought that I missed at the time? Yes. Okay. Now, Deborah Grimes, I can see you're you're in here. Deborah, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Thanks. Yeah, um, Lenny, it's it's great to see you. And just seeing that clip of um, Garage, it just brings me back. I remember how moved I was. Um, such a such a portrait of loneliness is incredibly, incredibly strong strong film um i suppose i'm, I'm yeah this is my question really is that I've, I've been in the industry for a while now mostly as a script writer and kind of reached the point of uh really really struggling i don't know whether it's post covid but really pushing things forward or really having people even looking at your work yeah um it's it's really difficult i i'm some really sort of reaching sort of a an impasse of, of feeling I've used up all the tools in my arsenal to, to move things forward. And it just seems like is it the climate or I suppose my question is, I suppose for you, you'd have to really look back quite a while, quite, quite a yeah. while ago when you first started out, what, what sort of, what were the, some of the, maybe some of the craziest things you've done to really push things forward when you feel you're at this impasse and you can't, 
it's really difficult even getting people to to notice your work or yeah. or you have this slate of work that you're trying to absolutely <laughs> move along you know yeah I totally get that because um there's you know it goes back to that how difficult it is when you're sort of it is a lonely feeling you know going back to that yeah. idea of garage and it's also a feeling when you think nobody cares whether I do this or that and you're sitting there at your desk and it's very easy to become very discouraged I had a few years of that um because when I came back from America having done having made this big decision that I was going to concentrate on trying to make films um there were about five years where I sat in my flat and didn't have any money and was writing not really believing in what I was writing sort of half and then sharing it but and nobody's knocking on your door you know and that's a lo it is a lonely place and what I did to get over that I said to myself I just have to be doing something in this film world I can't sit here it's not healthy I you know I could feel myself beginning to lose heart and so I I I went hell for leather to try and get any work I could making anything so I ended up sort of bullying my way into commercials I made some sort of free demo commercials and stuff I thought first of all I have to make a living and secondly I need to be shooting because you, your muscles kind of waste away if you don't use them so that was the probably the because I have no interest really in that kind of filmmaking but it was a really good thing for me to do because it, it just made movement and and through movement I met people and actually the producer of the commercials Johnny Spears that I worked with he was the producer of Adam and Paul and he met Mark O'Halloran and introduced us and none of that would have happened probably if I hadn't just said right uh, I'm going to do it but I think what's difficult as a writer is that it is the hardest role in the industry I really think that because on the one hand you're the person that all starts with um it's solo and also you you have you know people will take your work and sort of do whatever they want with it so it's it's got it's really hard in all aspects I think the only thing you can do is ask yourself maybe is there any uh, and this is like a, it's a probably a longer conversation but is there any um way in which you can kind of go through a similar process like adjacent to the things you really want to do that just creates that energy and movement and contact and you know what I mean so so it might not be the script that you that is your desire it might be like is there anywhere you know can I write on something that I maybe don't love but feel like it would at least become a a kind of a, a conduit to other things I do think I think it's really hard. I do think, however, when you make that, when you do make that shift and you do get somebody's attention and you do begin to get work out there, it's very sunny on the other side because there's such a demand for material. There is such a kind of hunger for it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of the, yeah. the best yeah. I can do. But I remember I had many, there were there was a long period where I thought I shouldn't have left philosophy. I made a terrible mistake nobody's interested I'm not in, I'm even doubting it now um but I think you just have to sort of look where you are and say what what are the concrete steps you know just from where I am now that maybe don't look like I want them to look but you'd be surprised you need to be moving and if you're moving you never know where you'll end up but if you yeah. just wait you probably nothing you know it's possible nothing will happen it's so true. I think it's worth it it's true yeah I'm actually currently novelizing a script so that seemed like that's something a like, really good idea yeah yeah that's a really yeah. really good idea yeah yeah. Lenny, can I just ask you something quickly? Are you an Irish sure. language speaker? I was curious. Do you speak Irish? No, but my grandfather, the famous oh. grandfather was, he was actually, he he got uh, Skull and Trinity as in Irish, in oh, French and okay. Irish, and then okay. he did medicine. So th there were Irish speakers. I wish I was. My son's actually going to the Grail oh, and So yeah. I'm hoping that, are you? Yes. Yeah. I wish I, I was. Kind of in I terms know. of cinema, I was kind of interested in trying to go down that road, but I was curious. Oh, well, that's, I mean, yeah. Did you see on Colleen Kuhn? I did, yeah. Yeah. Great, isn't it? Yeah, loved it. Yeah. I think most people probably have. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that. that Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, thanks Deborah. That that was great. De Deborah, I know, and, and she made a wonderful short film called The Yellow Dress. Thank you. Um I, and I'd love uh, to see she, it. Yeah, yeah, I can send you a link to it. Um, yeah, brilliant. But she she's a great scriptwriter. Um I mean, I'm just wondering from from her point of view, is the answer to get a an, an agent in this business or not I don't think so I think um I mean if you it's very different like I didn't get an agent until 
I got an agent in the UK after Adam and Paul. So I made Adam and Paul without the without an agent. And then I had off I didn't get a, an American agent until two two films after that. Yes. And and I think it depends on what you want to do. Um, mm. I, I've never, nothing has ever come in through the agent that I've done. Oh. It's always been generated on this side, you know. Although yeah. Frank actually, well, Frank came from a contact in film four and I loved my, I love my agent. You know, she's amazing and brilliant for advice and negotiation and all that stuff. Yeah. But I yeah. think, I don't think it's essential, but you know, and you probably won't get one these days until you've got something out there. That's yeah. the reality of it as well. Yeah, yeah. I think the positive as well, Lenny, uh, and I'm only doing this from, from reading, is the amount of facilities for um, film production in Ireland is shot through the roof. It's extraordinary. Amazingly. Yeah. And actually, if you're interested, if you're a director, if you want to be a director, it's a really good time because you can go and make stuff even mm. on your phone yes. at a really high level. I mean, when, when I was starting, somebody had to give you real money to buy actual film you know mm -hmm. and 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 a film camera and all that stuff so it's very possible and there is a huge kind of uh network here now when i made my first short there were two shorts made in ireland that year and no features i mean it's amazing when you think about it now like it now yes. it's a you know yeah yeah extraordinary um, I'm just going to run through uh, some of the comments that have been made because they don't appear on YouTube when, when we, we we have the recording. So I'll run through them. Bernadette Kiley says, is Frank available to view, to view, please? Yes, Frank is. It might be. It has been on and off Netflix. But if it's not on uh, one of the streaming services, it's it'll be available on, um, for example, iTunes or any of those movie chat movie buying sites that you can get on your either smart tv or your computer yeah okay thanks for that um maggie says to everybody whoops she's slipped there sorry uh first time joining an episode of the art as well class job thanks everyone that's very nice <laughs> that's nice thanks very much i'll take that as a credit credit to me alan i think uh, oh almost definitely yourself <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um eilish says great episode great to have the art as well back again my question for lenny of all your creative endeavors, which one are you most proud of, of and why? Oh wow! Damn, I, I was meant to say that one. <laughs> That's a really hard one, you know. I'm really proud. Like asking of... which your favorite child is. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, Try it anyway. <laughs> I'll I'll have a crack. I actually think possibly, in a way, aspects of garage probably are like because it's very simple and. It, you know, and actually you're asking about music. There's one music cue really, apart from the top and the tail and the whole of Garage and the fact that you can watch something as boldly as that and that it works for me is a kind of, you know, I think it's it's very close to what we were trying to achieve. Um, and it's, it's I feel very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. Alico says, uh, fascinating interview. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I got that one. Terrific. Thank Listening you. to both. Uh, Gillian, uh, is there any... Is there any are there any courses in cinematic photography? I do my own photography, but it'd be very interesting to do that. Yes, there are. Um, and I'm I'm not sure now. I think uh, like the, uh, in in various ways. So there are ones that would be part time. There are various colleges that offer them. I don't have it at my fingertips, but if you go Googling, I mean, you could go to film school as a cinematographer. That's quite a big commitment, you know, but then there are. Um, uh, some there are shorter courses in cinematography and it's a great thing because it is it's the marriage of photography and movement you know and huge amount of what's interesting about photography and, and what you need to know from photography carries over into cinematography but if you think about it just technically you know when you set up a photograph it just has to be right from that precise angle and you know mm -hmm. and then you're trying to create a situation where you're able to move around a room and still to have it work and not shadow and you know the shadow of the person operating the camera and all these highly technical things come into consider become considerations it's really interesting work yeah okay maria gabriella serpi who's in rome and uh, she, she's a great fan and she's stuck with Thank us you. over in rome um when a movie is not based on a novel how do you start working is that the case is is, is it contacting a script writer in the first step Sorry, well, so, yeah. so in the case of, say, what Richard, well, no, what Richard did is kind of was inspired by a real event. And there yeah. was a novel as well, but we really didn't use the novel, even though. So in that case, it's quite interesting was it was a conversation between me and Mal Campbell, who 
wrote it, but I really also sort of devised it in that we got the actors together in that case mm. and worked with the actors to develop the story. So that was an unusual one. Um, Frank was existed because John Ronson had worked with a man called Frank Sidebottom. And so that grew out of something half real as well. With Garage, Mark and I were sitting down and we'd made Adam and Paul and we were talking about what the next project would be and we started one thing and it didn't quite work out and one day mark told the story of of this man in his town in ennis when he was a kid who ran a garage and something quite similar happened in, in the case of this man um and he did take his own life and that's where that grew from and what we did was we sat down and we talked it through and then i wrote this big kind of outline of how the film might run based on our conversations and then Mark wrote the screenplay. So there are various ways in which it happens. So the novel thing is very, you know, it's very, it's very tempting because you have something there already and you can kind of, you know, graft your own ideas onto it. But I'm going back now to, I'm writing at the moment and it's a film about that's sort of set in my own childhood in, in the kind of Jewish family in, uh, in Dublin. And, um, that's just me with a strong kind of sense, set of images. Okay. Um, we're nearly at time, but there's two two more, if, if you don't mind, Lenny. Not at uh, all. Okay. So um, Brenda Moore McCann, who's an art historian, um, she's asked a question. Talking about lighting, would Caravaggio in painting and Orson Welles in cinema have been of interest to you? Definitely. I mean, the, the Caravaggio, you know, is such a kind of feels so modern when you look at him, you know, like that kind of what feels like kind of single source, very immediate. Um, I think he may have used one of those, isn't the theory that he may have used one of those kind of pinhole cameras to, um, you know, mm. create an image to work from. Yes. But yeah, there's a kind of sense of movement and arrested movement and, and, and energy and, and the lighting there is very beautiful and also cold, which I love, kind of cold lighting, yeah. cold light. Um, and Wells, yes, I've never been interested. Wells as a as a technician, you know, I, I sometimes find find it um, you know, it's very self-aware in that sense. But if you look at the debt, like Wells, actually the person who's closer to me than Wells would be Renoir, who also uh Renoir, the son of Renoir the painter, who who made these extraordinary films again with that very deep focus and moving bodies in 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 the frame so the frame remains where it is and and you you tell the story by by moving objects within that moving people within that and and there's a film of his which is called um the rules of the game le règle de jeu which i would absolutely recommend so highly it's a sort of a, it's an it's a kind of evisceration of um uh, upper class manners um in france at the time mm. but it's it's amazing and uh I think it's a, it's a good example of there's something Wellesian in it, but I sort of think there's more uh, harsh in there. Yeah, yeah. Lenny, we've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much. Not at all. It's, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. I know, it's been my pleasure, and, and I know everyone else's. And, uh, you know, on their behalf, thank you so much um, for being with us today and giving of your time. Um, have you any plans, immediate plans? Um, apart from bringing the dogs for a walk. Apart from bring, uh, and bringing my daughter to drama yeah um uh, my my only oh here's the dog yeah the only um other plan is yeah just um i'm going to see something in the fringe tonight and then keep mm -hmm. on working towards this uh, project that i was mentioning about you know set in my family sort of adjacent to my family in the okay. in the 70s is that is, is what i'm going to be working on for the next few months Fantastic. Listen, Lenny, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. It was an absolute pleasure. I wish pleasure. you every future success.